Hi everybody, welcome to a new edition of Let's Talk About Education with Antonio Corrales. As you may know, I'm an educator, an entrepreneur, and a professor at the University of Houston Creole Lake. My main goal is to introduce you to pioneers in the field of education and to let you know about topics that you may not be aware of, but you may be interested in. Today, we have the honor to have with us Dr. Robert Jones, a university professor who has trained hundreds of professionals in the field of STEM education. He has changed the life of many students in this area. Thank you so much for being with us today, Dr. Jones. My pleasure, Antonio. <laughs> it's been a long, cold, lonely winter. Little darling, it feels like years since it's been here. Here comes the sun. All right, Dr. Jones, why don't you, why don't we allow you to introduce yourself to the audience and talk a little bit about your impressive career in, uh, in education, and how do you get where you are right now? <laughs> well, uh, it started a long, long time ago, and I did not intend to be in education. I was trained in engineering and mathematics, but uh, got a call that uh, uh, I had a choice of either going into the military or teaching <laughs> mathematics in Pasadena. So <laughs> I came to Pasadena Independent School District on an emergency certification and spent the next three th years there working on certification. And I did become a certified mathematics and later science and social studies teacher. Um, I left uh, the teaching profession in 1964 to go to work for NASA. Okay. I. Uh, I was hired as a science educator to travel around the country and go to schools and talk about uh, Project Gemini, uh, which was just ending, and Project Apollo, which was coming up, wow. the mission to land a man on the moon. I did that for three years, and uh, while continuing uh, uh, some collegiate work, completed a master's degree, and um, then I went into the civil service at NASA and spent a couple of years there working on Project Apollo. I was awarded a NASA doctoral fellowship. They sent me back to Oklahoma, where I'm from. And, but instead of going to the University of Oklahoma, where my bachelor's degree was from, I went to Oklahoma State, got a doctorate, spent a year at OU as a visitor, and then came back to Houston, and they built the University of Houston Clear Lake just for me. <laughs> well, it felt that way. So I began working here in the first year we were open. Okay. 1975, I uh, was here full time. I also was acting director of the Nature Center right down the street, Armand Bio Nature Center, and later the educational director there. Okay. And again, I for the next 20 to 25 years, I was associated with NASA as I ran their summer programs for teachers. And it was at that point, heavily influenced by uh, the NASA experience, that we started looking at uh, what became known as teaming up. Okay which is a cooperative, collaborative learning technique uh, that became very popular in the 80s and 90s. Uh, and then it has now reemerged as teaming up for STEM. Okay. And so that's where we are today. And well, and I wanted to ask you about that because why, well, I guess because of your background in science, but I wanted to ask you, first of all, if you can explain to the audience, what's STEM education? I mean, what is that? Uh, and why are you so passionate about that? We understand that science, uh, you know, technology, uh, engineering, mathematics, uh, but what's STEM education in general, and why do you feel so passionate about Why uh, Why is so important to you, this topic? Well, that's a great question, and uh, I will just basically say that STEM is an acronym for science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And another issue that I hope we can talk a little bit later about is uh, a new term has emerged, STEAM, mm -hmm. and which is science, technology, engineering, the arts, and mathematics. I'm even more passionate about that now. That's That's been something added to it. Absolutely. We'll talk about that. Absolutely. But what started out with NASA was um, we spent a lot of time, I went to over a thousand schools in mm -hmm. 10 states, and I went to all the science fairs. I went to everything educational can imagine. I went to every civic club. It, it was a wonderful experience in learning about education. And uh, I started sensing um, that there was a difference in what was going on and what was being taught in the schools. Okay. Um, this what, had, do you, what do you mean by that? Well, uh, let's take something like science fair. Okay. Uh, science fair is an excellent operation, but it goes back 
to 1900s. Okay. <laughs> it, uh, it's an individual operation. Uh, it's, it's a single student. Uh, my experiences at NASA, you were on teams. Okay. Sometimes not just one team, but two teams at a time. And you'd have to balance your home team with your operational team. Exactly. So that was left out of it. So that became something that got tucked away in my memory. Interesting. Yeah, and, and that's something that by way of course in every, almost in every organization nowadays, uh, it's really rare that you're going to work uh, as an individual. You usually work in teams, right? Well, that is correct. Now, you can still do individual work, and we really appreciate the individuals. And But we have to then, uh, what happened at NASA was I learned how a group of a very aggressive, uh, highly trained individuals can learn to cooperate, and it was the brainstorming process. Putting the egos aside and having everybody having a role, right? Having some rules. You know, you can attack someone's ideas, but don't attack the person. <laughs> well, this just wasn't occurring in the school, so I just exactly. kept tucking these things away mm -hmm. until I got to the NASA doctoral fellowship, and then they paid me to actually uh, study this and bring it into modern day education. So mm -hmm. I'm very appreciative. Uh, and then to get to spend the next uh, from 1975 to 1995, I was director of the Summer Aerospace Institute at NASA Johnson Space Center. And so we got to work and do this team training with teachers. Well, and, and, and you know that, that for the next 10 years, most of the jobs available are going to be in the STEM field. In, in the STEM field. So, you know, is that something that, that make you pursue this field even more nowadays, knowing that you know, you, you, you may be creating productive citizens in, in the long term. <laughs> well, as you know, Antonio, I should have retired about 10 years ago. But, <laughs> but, but we don't want you to. <laughs> well, but uh, we would have never met if I'd have done that, nor exactly. some of our other colleagues exactly. in this. So, uh, yeah, I was there for the start of it. There were, there were lots of experimental programs. There was integrated science uh, mathematics mm -hmm. projects. There was the Society of Motion Engineering uh program mm -hmm. and but we could just get the uh the teaming up model which came out of this with the teachers okay explain a little bit the audience what is, what is that concept of teaming up and and i think you kind of introduced it a little bit with the nasa but explain explain to the audience what do you mean by teaming up with tem uh, okay well uh, again that's something that has just emerged within the last 10 years okay. and and uh, we'll mention that but what was going on back with the teacher institutes is we would go and observe NASA flight control teams. Okay. We would observe NASA engineering teams, uh, NASA recovery teams. Everybody was on these operational teams. Mm -hmm. Well, having had a couple of years experience serving on uh, a couple of the, these teams mm -hmm. in flight control and uh, lunar, uh, on the lunar mission, somebody has to pick up the astronauts and get them home. Uh -huh. And that was the team that I worked on. So. Uh, uh, we were just pa passing this on to teachers, and, and uh, we would have 50 teachers from the Houston area every summer, half enrolled through UH Clear Lake and half enrolled through UH Central Campus. So it was a rich mixture, and they, they really came up with these ideas. Okay. And they started looking at, well, here's how we could put teams in the field. The other thing they noticed was that everybody had a job. Okay. And if you did, their jo did the jobs, the jobs all fit together, and the team project or the team objective was uh, fulfilled. So we started looking at this and we looked at five member teams, four member teams, three member teams and, and finally we, we came up with uh, what would be introduced with gifted and talented education when that started in, in uh, the Clear Creek ISDs was something we call teaming up. And, and, and the interesting part is that you brought that concept to the classrooms which is something that you know, it could serve for so many purposes, including including behavior management, by the way. Oh, by the way, it, uh, if you do it right, the students run their own classroom, they set their own limits. Uh, I mean, you never have to attack a student's behavior. You have to say, okay, whose job is that? Look at, look at your card. Who's supposed to be getting the materials? Right. Okay, you other guys, get your hands off that ruler. Because everybody has their, everybody has their own That's job right. description, and they, they know what their job description is when they're trying to accomplish whatever goal, right? Correct, and so I was very appreciative in the early 1980s when Clear Creek ISD asked me to institute this with their gifted and talented program. So one day a week for two years, I would go and meet with a great group of fifth graders mm -hmm. 
Uh, sometimes there would be a fourth grader or, or a third grader in there. Uh, and we worked on this. We had very uh, ethnically and culturally diverse mm -hmm. populations. We had uh, a very large, and this is very true then and getting more so today, we had a very large complement of females. And um, this allowed us to, to mix genders. Mm -hmm. And uh, so a lot of the things that are commonplace today really got started with this in the 1970s and the 1980s. That is super interesting. Well, and, and the good thing about it, because I, I, have, seen, I, have, seen you, I have seen the teaming up in action, is that uh, the roles rotate. So every oh, yes. child's not going to have the same role you know, throughout the entire period, but they, they take, take different turns to, to do the different roles. That's correct. We rotate through the roles, and um, actually, uh, we, we, as you know, we have some materials here on your website. We're getting ready to put a role rotation chart yes, up there. Yes, and, and those materials for the viewers are in sterlingevaluationandassessment.com. Sterlingevaluationandassessment.com. You can find any material related to teaming up for STEM uh, and any other uh, materials that Dr. John has developed are posted there for your uses whenever you want to go there. Why don't you talk to the audience a little bit about STEAM, though? I mean, I know you're, you're really passionate, as you said, about that. Well, and, I am. Yeah. Okay. So. Well, uh, along the way, I became interested in some uh, different learning pedagogies and technologies and fell under the influence of a couple of uh, philosophers and psychologists, and one of them was Bob Samples who felt like we need to teach both sides of the mind. Mm -hmm. So the left hemispheric, right hemispheric uh, uh, mind model, they originally called it a brain model, but that didn't work out. But this model came through and it's, it's grown a lot since then. And uh, we started looking at, well, it's, it's nice to design something, uh, but then it's just as nice to write about it, create a song or a poem about it, yeah. an act, uh, Design, uh, art, design, and so we, we have begun to integrate that into STEM. And that has become very, very popular because it reaches out um, beyond just the science, the technology, the engineering. Correct, because you put the STEM plus the liberal arts in there. It could also be uh, different languages as well. Very uh, much so. Yeah, I, yeah. I, any, any type of uh, area connected to, to art. Well, we look, and again, the history and philosophy of mathematics and science and uh, who invented this engineering process? What's Newton's methods for finding square roots? What's the story? Uh, Bordin, a uh, great mathematician, but he wrote the Polovician dances, which ended up on Broadway. <laughs> and then, of course, uh, Charles Ludwig Dodson, who uh, created, uh, oh, what is that character in, in uh, English literature? The girl and the rabbit in the hole. Uh -huh, uh -huh, yeah, yeah. And um, the Queen of England once asked him, she said, oh, I so enjoyed, uh, I so enjoyed the story. Are you going to publish the other? And he said, yes. And he, so she said, well, please send me the book. And he did. And it was a treatise on the solution of quartic equations. So <laughs> there's always been this mixture of art and music among yeah. the people. And you can go into all Leonardo of da Vinci, you know, he, he was, used to be an artist. Ben, Benjamin sure. Franklin. I mean, they have so many components. Sure. Now, let me ask you this. Um, you and I have been, are in these schools all the time trying to help uh, teachers and administrators to, to improve, improve STEM education. Now, when you go there, we tend to see a disconnect between um, steaming up for STEM and, and, and the concepts of engineers working together to accomplish a goal and even simple curriculum uh, guidelines and the end results. In other words, we have the, 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 the reality is that numbers don't lie. 80% of the job in the STEM field goes to males. And there's a lot of jobs, for example, in the chemistry industry that are not acquired by U.S. citizens because we have not, we are not preparing them to acquire those jobs yet. For example, we see that the first chemistry class that uh, students tend to ten, uh, take is in high school. And, and only 10% of the student body take AP chemistry across the nation. Um, so what recommendations you have for teachers, administrators, and educators in general to increase STEM education or STEAM education in their schools? Uh, and, 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 and also, can STEAM education be cost-effective? 
Oh, I think it is very cost effective. For one thing, um, you don't need any specialized materials. We actually just use, re, reduce, reuse, recycle is a big part of STEM. Yeah. So uh, I brought one little so activity to show you here today. This is the milk carton car, uh -huh. and it has a balloon rocket uh, propulsion system. And of course, these are the famous push-ups. <laughs> and uh, these so, things. So well, this is this is just a. a, a uh, milk container, right? Yes. Milk container. Or this is, orange this juice. Is, this is just a, or an orange This is a helium quality balloon. Helium balloon. This is a straw from a local restaurant. Okay. Uh, there's a rest. There is a, a rubber band wrapped around there, and this produces a reaction balloon rocket. Wow. Follows. Uh, and these are the wheels. The third law of motion. The wow. wheels are from push push ups. Wow. Now they've been trimmed down to give a. A faster and students have worked on this for hours and they have tested it and it will run very very fast or we will run a great distance and you can measure uh, you know uh, strength you can measure speed you can measure so many distance, so many there, distance right so many concepts you can make any extremely right. cost effective now do, can the students build that do they still oh they sir activity? they build many of them yeah. they and they also they work with uh, they make the balloon rockets and race them down the fishing they line and race. they're wow. surprised when they'll go the distance of across the gymnasium and then they can do charge <laughs> you bet yeah velocity time wow. and they look at the effects of uh, see this is a convergent divergent nozzle just mm -hmm. like on a regular rocket but it's works on air now this right. is a concept that can be introduced at what grade level first second third uh, what do you I'd like to see them start working on this at about third grade third grade and in the teams by third grade now, before that, there, there are other well-documented pairs of pairs and other how to, talk, uh, how to talk to another student, you know, turn and talk. And uh, our early childhood edu educators do a jo good job of that. Okay. So if they can just communicate with at least one other person by third grade, they can operate and fill out one of the three or four or even five roles mm. in the models that are on your homepage. Now, I'd like to add one more thing. Absolutely. This looks like a milk carton, doesn't it? Yeah. Uh, but what we would do while they're putting this together and testing it, we would give them construction paper that it exactly fits the side of this, uh -huh. and we would ask them to draw a design, which later they could tape or glue onto the sides. And uh, with this, or with a uh, much larger egg drop container, where they have built to protect an egg from the second or third floor dropped onto concrete, uh, they get to also get into the A part, the arts, and come up with uh, words, statements, poetry, a song, that is so and artwork. So we're adding the A into all of the old uh, projects that we've had for many, many years. <laughs> that is so interesting. That is fantastic. So knowing that, that it is possible to, because a lot of people think, okay, for me to, I'm thinking administrators that are watching us right now, they may think, Oh, for me to increase team in my school, I will need labs. So, and you're really done. You can do this in the classroom. Why can't you tell? Why, well, can, why can't you tell to administrators out there that they're looking to increase their their STEAM education in their schools and make it more effective? Well, uh, that was just the introduction of it in the elementary school. Uh, by middle school, you can get into careers. You can get into college readiness. And as you know, and and you've participated in for the last couple of years. For the last 11 years, actually maybe 12 years, we've worked with the Bernard Harris Foundation under the sponsorship of ExxonMobil to do over 350 two-week residence camps for middle schoolers mm -hmm. at universities. And from that, uh, you and uh, our team here yeah. at the University of Houston Clear Lake, with assistance from the UH Central Campus and the Harris Foundation, are developing non residence camps for middle st schoolers to attend, and our first ones will be this summer. Which you can see a lot of impact for, for the middle schoolers because then they're going to be taking those classes in high school, right? And, and the potential, you know, college, uh, college yeah. credits. Uh, well, one students. of our colleagues, who I'm sure you'll interview yeah. one day, Dr. Yeah. Michelle Peters, yeah. has been tracking these students for 10 yeah. years. Yeah. And it's an amazing set of data. Yeah. And yeah. Uh, an amazing participation by females. Yes, yes. Which is, which is multiple that. ethnicities, which is languages. Big. It really is. So one recommendation will be exposing the, 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 the students and the staff towards 
towards uh, STEAM activities that may not, or STEAM camps that may not be that complicated. But what well, about- Well, now you are correct. And we want to, we also want to export this training to local school districts. Okay. And, and basically the Harris model uh, featured educational presentations by STEM experts. So you need to be looking around your community. And I don't care if you're in very rural, agrarian Texas or Oklahoma, or, our mountainous Colorado, New Mexico, you're going to find us. Correct. Uh, you need to be in touch with the, the local community colleges because they're doing a pretty good job of training at the technical level. Correct. I noticed that uh, there's just been an increase of a lot of money based on rebuilding Houston. Correct. And they're, they're down into the trades. They're teaching drywalling and things like this. So be in touch with what are the resources in your community. Well, and that exposure, as you're saying, that exposure, th those two weeks during the summer can make such a difference in those students because they, they get to experience what college life looks like, even though if they don't have to sleep there, at least perceiving what a college life looks like. And also being exposed to uh, STEM activities that they may have never been exposed before. Um, what about the staff? Well, that's the second part. Yeah. Uh, we want to take the elements of the Harris Foundation model, which were educational presentations by STEM experts. Uh -huh. um, we want to take uh, the hands-on activities, which we just showed you a couple models of that, and that the classroom teachers can do and everything from history to science to math. Uh, we want to see that we, one of the things we recommend is that the students actually get to operate and document in research and development notebooks what they're doing. And then we also are big on field experiences. I know that uh, there have been cutbacks from time to time in that, but you can locate field experiences and at least have one or two STEM field experiences per year. And then just finally, uh, start a network, and that's what we want to start doing with staff development at our Center for Educational Programs here. We want to develop a network of 100 or so school districts around here. We want to locate all these resources and disseminate them, and that's how we can help administrators and teachers in the field. Correct. Now, what about parents, though? Because, I mean, they, sometimes, you know, we do a lot of training for administrators and educators, but we tend to forget about parents. And, and you know, you and I know that they play a critical role, you know, educating the children, play, uh, you know, uh, playing a, a team role, bringing the child to, to college and, and, and to whatever profession they want to do. What recommendations do you have for parents who are looking to uh, improve their STEAM you know, uh, knowledge and their STEAM uh, uh, exposure for their children. Uh, what, what can you tell them? Well, one of the interesting things that I have learned from the Harris Foundation Project is like at the end of each camp, they would have a parent day and parents would be invited to come and see their uh, children present on their project activities and other activities they did in the camp. We're going to do that with the one-week non-residence camps also. We also uh, have take-home letters. For instance, one of our activities early on is we teach uh, uh, fourth and fifth graders how to test a consumer product. Uh, I believe the one that you and I worked on is uh, the quicker picker-upper, and we look at three brands mm -hmm. of paper towels. Mm -hmm. And we measure two, two elements about this. One, which will pick up the most, mm -hmm. And we can time that also. The time is, is, is not a variable, it's a constant. Uh, and they just know that it's paper towel brand A, B, and C. They may find out that the bargain towel does as good a job as the very expensive towel. Correct. The second thing we do is we teach a little bit about qualitative research in that we give them the same three samples while they're uh, samples that they've dipped in colored water or drying out to see how high the colored water line is. They're rubbing these on their forearms and checking the value from one to five on how soft they think it is. So we teach them about two elements of research, quantitative where they do a physical measurement and qualitative where they get a sense of how individuals Well, and the interesting about. part is that those experiments, schools can also develop in a, in a PTA meeting, you know, and, and also expose the parents to, to them to understand. Correct. This is something that they can do at home. Well, and we recommend that, and one of the things we're going to do this summer is once we do this activity early in the week, we send the results home and, and the children discuss it with their parents and say, hey, they taught me how to test anything. Soap, soda drinks, you know, we just set That's it up. Idea. A versus B versus C. And um, 
they, they, uh, they introduce their parents to it. And then we invite the parents to come, be sure and come on Friday and see the other things they've learned about it. That is fantastic. And definitely uh, we will have uh, the college readiness uh, people there ready to give them a tour, whatever they want. Uh, we just see this growing. I hope someday that uh, the middle school STEM course becomes an option to the general science course. Yes. I'm not saying do away with the general science course, mm -hmm. but maybe there could be take path A or path B. Mm -hmm. And I would like to see that. I think that's a logical way to go. The general science course uh, harkens back to the 19th century, and STEM has been born at the end of the 20th century. So that's where we sit today. That is fantastic. Now, Dr. John, to finish it up, do you have any final message for our audience, our educators, our administrators looking at us right now for any, any part of the world? What can you tell them about any final words about STEM education or STEAM education and, and how to increase that in, in their fields? Well, I don't know. Of course, it came to me late in my career. I've been here at the university for 40 years, and I was out in the field for another 10 or 15 before that. And, and as I joked with Antonio about retiring, and it's, uh, I have a wonderful group here. I would say that the educators of today at the university level that train teachers and administrators are very involved in this. And uh, again, uh, just let us know, how can we serve you? send us, I don't say tweets, but however they communicate <laughs> with you, we'd be glad to hear. Give us an idea, and we'll try it out here. Well, well thank you so much one more time My pleasure. for being here with us My today. Pleasure. Our viewers, remember that we have this video and many other videos at our YouTube channel, Antonio Corrales, and our webpage, sterlingevaluationandassessment.com. Please stay tuned and see you next time.